John's Gospel is the only of the three that uh, directly say that Jesus is God, G-O-D. John has his own uh, unique style and personality, and he records a lot of things that the Synoptic Gospels don't record. God is singular in what he is, his nature. He's plural, three persons, in who he is. God the Son uh, is the spokesperson. He's the voice of the Trinity. He had to learn all the things that uh, any human would have to learn. He had to be cared for and fed and his diapers needed to be changed just like any other uh, person. He joined himself to us forever. That's It's just so marvelous. It's mind-blowing. Matthew and Luke used Mark as they composed their Gospels. But his human nature is, is finite. It's only in one place at a time. Uh, he has a, a finite human brain. Welcome to Biblical Dhiman, and today our guest is Dr. Randy Rim, who is the senior pastor of Stony Creek Church in Michigan, USA. Dr. Randy is passionate about writing and biblical scholarship. In 2015, Dr. Randy published a scholarly book entitled Exegetical and Theological Analysis of the Son's Relationship to the Father in John's Gospel, God's Equal and Subordinate. In 2018, he published God the Son, What's John's Portrait of Jesus Means and Why It Matters. He has also published scholarly journal articles on John's Christology. So it's a joy to have you here, sir. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to speak with you. So let's begin with your story. Tell us about yourself, that how did you come to know Jesus Christ? Well, I was uh, raised in a in a Catholic home and uh, had a reverence for God, but didn't have a personal relationship with him until I visited an evangelistic meeting uh, during the Jesus Movement. That was a worldwide revival movement. And this was in 1973, and I responded to an invitation to receive Christ, and that was January 12, 1973. And my life was transformed from that day on. Technically, our church is in a Baptist denomination, but we don't stress so much the name Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to say we're Christian with a big C and Baptist with a small B. Uh, because we're we're not about labels, we're not about denominations. Yeah. We're about uh, Jesus Christ and uh, forming a personal relationship with Him. You have written a book on John, uh, Gospel of John, and uh, uh, we would like to know that why is the Gospel of John? First, is who is John, and why his Gospel is different than other synoptic Gospels? Yeah. Well, uh, the traditional view, which I embrace, is that uh, the Gospel of John is written by John the Apostle, John the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, who actually was one of the 12 apostles who followed Jesus. And so he was an eyewitness to Jesus' ministry. Now, the difference between John and the other three Gospels um, is a complicated question, but very simply, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what are known as the synoptic Gospels, synoptic Gospels, because they all see the ministry of Jesus from the same basic viewpoint. And the most uh, accepted view among scholars is that the Gospel of Mark was written first uh, based on Peter's eyewitness testimony. And then Matthew and Luke used Mark as they composed their Gospels. And so these three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar to each other because they're following that same basic format. Whereas the Gospel of John is uh, independent of the other three. Now, I, I think John knew of those other Gospels, especially Mark, um, but he's not dependent on them. 
he's uh, he's just giving his own recollections, and there's a there's overlap between the synoptic gospels and John, but uh, John has his own uh, unique style and personality, and he records a lot of things that the synoptic gospels don't record, and so it's unique in that way. Uh, so John's more of the focus is on Christ's divinity, right? I, I think the other uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, I think they uh, make known the deity of Jesus, his divinity, but they do so in other ways. Uh, John's Gospel is the only of the three that uh, directly say that Jesus is God, G-O-D, uh, using that very word. In, in Greek, it's thaos. Uh, John 1, 1 says the word, referring to the Son, Jesus the Son, the word was God. And at the very end of the gospel, Thomas, the doubting Thomas, says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Now, the other gospels uh, certainly assert the, the deity of Jesus, but they do it in other ways. And John is communicating, I think, to a different audience and so he mm. he uh, puts his stress in in uh, on different things yeah absolutely uh, and also there is an um, ongoing debate for centuries now about their divinity and the humanity of jesus uh, christians say that jesus is fully divine and yet we see his uh, jesus limitation as human so is jesus truly a god and in other words how can be he god and yet submit to god Yes, that's a very important question. From the biblical point of view, the Christian position is that there is only one God. He created all things. He is not the universe. He cannot be identified with the universe. He is distinct from the universe. He's related to it because he created it. But the universe is finite, and God is uh, infinite and had no beginning. Uh, but the, the distinctive Christian biblical view is that uh, within the nature of the one God, there are three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, three uh, consciousnesses, uh, three uh, personalities, more than per just personality, but persons who can relate and talk to one another. And these three share the same being, the same nature as uh, the others. All three share the same nature. And it's the Son of God, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, but the Son of God who uh, came to uh, earth, entered time and space by being conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary and uh, took on human nature. So the Son of God has two natures. He has his divine nature, and he has his human nature. And his divine nature, of course, is, is infinite. But his human nature is, is finite. It's only in one place at a time. Uh, he has a, a finite human brain, and so you, you, you can't fit infinite knowledge into a, a, a human brain. So in his humanity, he is uh, he has voluntarily uh, limited himself uh, when he's expressing himself through his human nature. But he he's both God and man simultaneously. His divinity is not diminished. It, uh, when he becomes man, it's just that in his human nature, he has these limitations. When we talk about Jesus, so in, uh, in the gospel, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. So was Jesus like all of us or any of us, like he grew yeah. up, like we grew up? Exactly right. Yes. Uh, his human nature, uh, obviously, when he was uh, uh, in the manger, when he was newborn, uh, he didn't know nuclear physics. He didn't know how to speak. He didn't know how to write. He had to learn all 
the things that uh, any human would have to learn. He had to be cared for and fed and his diapers needed to be changed just like any other uh, person. Um, and that's because he had become as a very important passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, talk about uh, the Son, Jesus Christ, being in the form of God before he came here to earth. He was in the form of God. He was equal with God, but he humbled himself. He emptied himself, that passage says, and also took upon himself the form of a servant. So he became a servant. He became dependent upon his father. And so when he was here on the earth in his human nature, he was living as all of us are supposed to live. And that is a life dependent on his father. It wasn't like when he walked around and he was hungry, he, he just created food in his stomach or he never needed to eat or never needed to sleep. No, he had all the, he went through all the same things that, that we go through, except he, he never sinned. He was without sin. That was the only difference. But in all these other respects, he was just as human as we are because he was representing us and he was going to take upon himself the sins of the world so he could pay the penalty we deserve to pay in our place on the cross and then be raised gloriously from the dead three days later. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful to hear that uh, he was like all of us. And uh, mm -hmm. and but yet at the same time, he was God. So what is the relation we can see between the Trinity, Father, Son and the Holy Spirit? How to distinguish? Because people think there are three different gods or there are three different mo modes that is called modalism. So how do you right. define Trinity? Uh, God is one in his essence, his nature. What does that mean? That means the totality of his attributes. He is spirit. Uh, that is, he has no physical form whatsoever. He is spirit. And that spirit is omniscient, omnipotent, uh, omnipresent, uh, all loving, um, uh, completely righteous, totally righteous, all the different attributes of God. That's God's nature. Okay. That's what God is. And that is singular. God is singular as to his nature or his essence, but God is plural in a different sense, and that is in who he is. He's singular in what he is, his nature. He's plural, three persons, in who he is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit, and, and so forth. But each have this same nature. They're all one being. Uh, they're all of the same family. That's a very rough analogy. Uh, and so they all share these attributes, and yet they commune with one another. And this is how God could be love for all eternity without before he created anything. Because within the nature of God, these three persons can relate to one another and love one another. If God is not three persons, or at least more than one person, then God cannot have as an eternal attribute love, because he would have to create uh, the universe create people or some kind of creatures to love them. But God is not dependent on creation. So he, in his uh, eternal uh, nature, they, they love each other. They have this perfect unity and mutual love for one another. They are three distinct persons, but one being, one in yeah. nature, one in a sense, one in power, mm -hmm. but they are three different persons. So as you mentioned about that, uh, about the creation. So uh, Colossians 1.15 says that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So is Jesus a created being as 
many people you know in jehovah witness they claim that jesus is a created being and when skeptics want to debate they just bring this verse up so how do you answer such question yes well jesus humanity had a beginning when he was conceived in the womb of mary but in colossians 1:15 uh, where he's called the firstborn over all creation. The word there is prototokos, prototokos. And it, uh, that word can mean firstborn in the literal sense, like you have your firstborn child. But that word also uh, can mean, depending on the context, uh, it can mean uh, supreme heir, supreme heir, the one who is preeminent over everything else. And it's used this way a number of times in the Old Testament. For example, in uh, uh, Psalm 89, verse 27, David is called the firstborn uh, over all the kings of the earth. Well, obviously, it's not talking of him as a literal firstborn child. It's talking about him being uh, the number one, the, the overall, the, the preeminent uh, one who will inherit all the nations. And that's the sense that's meant in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, because obviously in that passage, uh, as, as he, Paul goes on, he talks about all things being created in him by Christ. Mm -hmm. And it says in verse 17, that he is before all things. So he can't be one of the created things and uh, also be the creator of all things. And so it's clearly talking about him being the supreme heir of God the Father, that he's going to inherit all things, uh, the whole universe, and reign uh, over all things. It's not talking about his his origin. It's talking about his position as the heir okay. over all creation. Absolutely. I, I think, yeah, you said very well that it's about the position, right? Uh, right. And the, and the beginning of his humanity. So uh, can we uh, say that right now Jesus is in a physical form or is a spiritual form after his resurrection? Is Jesus is like and his physical body in the heaven right now? Or what the Bible says about well, it? He's both. Uh, he, he's never stopped being in his uh, nature God. So he's that always. Uh, but he, when he uh, became man in what we call the incarnation, when he became flesh, uh, he took on that new nature and he has it now till all he through all eternity. Um, he is still a human. That's why we can still relate to him. He's our high priest. And when he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, he ascended bodily and visibly. And uh, the, the uh, apostles, as they looked up into heaven, staring at him, the angels said, why, why are you looking up there? Uh, this, this Jesus whom you've seen go uh, from you will return the same way, the same way he left. So he's going to return with his body. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12 says that he'll, he'll have the wounds in his hands and side. And Revelation 1 says the same thing, that they'll look on him whom they have pierced and, uh, and see him. So and Paul says, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, man. Christ Jesus. So he still has his human nature and always will. He joined himself to us forever. That's, it's just so marvelous. It's mind-blowing. Uh, when he became human, he took on a human body, but also... Uh, uh, he's fully human. Uh, he has a human soul and a human uh, uh, mind, just like we do. Uh, all of that he has retained, but uh, somehow he is um, uh, forever linked, forever united with his 
uh, divine nature as well. They're not mixed together, but they're they're united. One person with two natures. One person, two natures. One nature is divine, the other is human. But the one person uh, no. expresses himself both ways, through the human nature and through the divine nature. Absolutely. So moving on to this question that uh, did Jesus travel to hell after his death on the cross? Where did he go? Uh, Jesus said to the thief crucified next to him, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. So Jesus went to be with his father. That's what he said right before he died. He said, in, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So his body stayed on the cross and eventually got buried, but his spirit went to be with uh, the Father. Now, there, there are some passages in the New Testament that have been interpreted uh, to mean that, that Christ, between his death and resurrection, uh, went to Hades, went uh, to proclaim to the spirits in, uh, in, in prison and so forth. Uh, a, a passage in 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about that. But I don't think that's talking about between his death and resurrection. I think that's talking about what happened in the ascension, in his ascension when he ascended. As uh, uh, numerous passages in the New Testament talk about him ascending far above all powers and principalities, the, the wicked spirits. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, he's talking about the, the wicked spirits that were imprisoned uh, in the spiritual realm uh, right at the time of the, the flood, when uh, the sons of God mated with human women and produced a, a demonic kind of an offspring. And those spirits, those wicked angels were punished for that and put into prison. And when Christ ascended into heaven, he proclaimed his victory over all those demonic spirits and, and, and saying, in effect, uh, your, your doom is near because I have conquered you. I've conquered you in every way, shape, manner, and form. And the Father, God the Father, is exalting me to his right hand. And so I think that's what that's talking about. So adding adding to this uh, one more question to this uh, okay. to the your answer. So if when Jesus was uh, crucified, he was dead, died for three days, and he was in the paradise, as, as the word says that mm -hmm. uh, Jesus told to the thief that you will be with me in the paradise. So mm -hmm. was God inactive for three days, or was he not involved with the creation? Yeah, that's that's a good question too. Uh, no, uh, remember, you've got God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and they're fully capable of running the universe. But remember, the, the son died, but he wasn't unconscious. Uh, uh, when, when a person dies, uh, the, the soul is separated from the body, and, uh, but the, the soul is still conscious. So Jesus didn't cease to exist. His, his soul wasn't sleeping. As, as I've already said, he, he, he told the, the thief, I'll be with you today in paradise. So there was no interruption uh, with his uh, consciousness or his existence, certainly, uh, during the, uh, between his, his death and resurrection. Okay, absolutely. So there is God was still active. Christ had the conscious spirit and he was working uh, among through the creation. So I want to bring again your uh, uh, attention to the gospel of John in the in the first words of the John 1. In the beginning was the word. So word in what sense was the word? It was the written word, verbal word. So what does it all about? Well, there it's not talking about the written word. I think the written word is kind of referring back to him, the, the living word. What it means there in John chapter 1, verse 1, is that God the Father is the, the first in rank in, in the Trinity, and God the Son uh, is the spokesperson. 
He's the voice of the Trinity. And so he's the one who comes into the world and reveals what God is like. He shows us what the Father is like, and he gives to us the Holy Spirit. And so he's the, the, the spokesperson. He's the voice of the Trinity. And this mm -hmm. is why I think there are, there are some indications in the Old Testament that the Son of God, before he came uh, to earth as a, as a human being in, in the incarnation, that uh, he, he made appearances during uh, the Old Testament, uh, pre-incarnate appearances, because he's the spokesman. He's the one who speaks for God. Okay, I think that's a good answer. That he's the spoken word in the Old Testament. He was appeared maybe uh, uh, in the in the form of Melchizedek, right? Or possibly, possibly. I think the the angel of the Lord, um, angel of uh, the who shows up, he seems to be identified with Yahweh, with the one true God. And in Genesis eighteen, that's a very important passage where Yahweh appears to. Abraham in the form of a man uh, with two other uh, angels. They're later called angels, but they look like, like men. And they appear to Abraham and they converse. They even have a meal together. Abraham washes their feet. And so they're, they're in human form. Uh, but uh, it says that Abraham is dialoguing there with Yahweh, with the Lord. And so uh, who would this be? Well, if the, the son or the lagos, the word later revealed in, in John, is the spokesperson, it, it stands to reason that uh, it would be, uh, he would be the one. And, and Jesus himself said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Right. I think he's referring back to those uh, instances. Absolutely. And also Jesus claims about his divinity in John chapter 8, verse 58, when he says, before Abraham, I am. He's taking the divine name, uh, I am, ego eimi there in the Greek, and applying it to himself. And uh, in John chapter 17, He's praying to his father, and he says, Father, you have given me your name. And this is why uh, in Philippians 2, it says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Lord in that context means Yahweh. And so the name above every name is Yahweh, every every Jewish person knew that, that the name above every name uh, is, is Yahweh. And that name, Jesus himself bears. He he has he he's the one to be known as, as Yahweh God. Yes, absolutely. Praise God. And also in, in the gospel of John, we say uh, we see that later he says that uh, Jesus did many acts that cannot be written here. So yes. why does John limit himself of writing those those incidents, those events, those miracles? Yeah, well, as he said, uh, I think he's speaking hyperbolically, but as he said, uh, if everything was written down, the world itself would not be able to contain the books. Uh, and so every time you, you record the life of a person in, uh, say, a biography, uh, you, you have to limit you can't say everything. You can't record every minute in the person's life. And the Gospels are ancient biographies, Greco-Roman biographies. And so uh, John had to limit himself, in, in his case, uh, to the things that he writes, the seven signs, the seven miracles in the first part of the book, the first uh, 12 or so chapters of the book. And then uh, to his passion in, in chapters 13 through uh, 21, passion and resurrection. Okay, yes. Now, mm -hmm. can you tell us about the Bible study you're running on a YouTube channel about how can we access to that? And is it free? Is it paid? You can please in, uh, inform our, our viewers. There are YouTube videos 
um, that are free. You just uh, go to that uh, YouTube link and uh, you can, uh, with a copy of my book, this is a hard copy of it, God the Son, uh, what John's portrait of Jesus means and why it matters will give you much more detail on the things that we've talked about here today. And uh, and the, uh, you can read the book. You can get it in hardcover or uh, paperback or Kindle. Uh, or you could just watch the videos. If that's all you want to do, just watch the videos. And uh, uh, you, you can go through that. There are 10 of them. And it'll teach you a lot more. And it's it's me. It's me just teaching right here in the same place that you're you're seeing me now. And uh, I go through a lot of this material. That's great. So I'll I'll share the link in the description box of his book and also the YouTube channel. So moving sure. on to the last question, which I asked that believers find reading the Bible very boring especially the youngsters, they find reading the Bible boring. So how can we develop the habit of reading the Bible and uh, how to get motivated of reading the Bible? Yeah, well, for kids, I would suggest that parents get uh, their, their children uh, an adventure Bible, a Bible that's on their level. There are uh, Bibles for, for children that have lots of really creative pictures, cartoon pictures and all that, that are just marvelous. And, and kids love those. And uh, wait until they get a little older to get them a full copy of the Bible uh, that they can read together. Um, the, um, the other thing I would suggest is that um, a person every day set aside a certain time of day to pray and read the word uh, a, a particular time of day. For me, it's in the morning. That's when I like to do it best. And to always ask God to give you insight into the word. He, the, the Bible is co-authored by humans and by God. It's inspired by God. So you can talk to the author and ask him to help you to understand. Uh, there, you can also go on um, uh, to the, the, the Bible app, the Version app, and you can uh, get the Bible in, in your own language. Uh, there are uh, uh, certain of those that you can um, listen to, so you can hear it as well as read it on, on, your, on your phone. And we need... We need two-way communication. We need uh, the, the earpiece to hear God, and that's in the Word of God, the Bible. And we also need the, the talking, uh, the microphone part, and that's prayer in order to have two-way communication with God. And uh, I would also suggest that uh, people get into a small group Bible study where they can learn together and discuss through passages. There's also a, a great uh, resource called uh, the Bible Recap. And I know of many, many people. It's been used all over the world, the Bible Recap. You can go uh, and Google that. Just Google Bible Recap. It's with Tara Lee Cobble. And many uh, people are using that. I've got people in my church that use it and just love it. I haven't gone through it myself but it takes people through the Bible in a, a piecemeal way so that they understand it, it gets applied to their life, and it becomes a, a delightful experience. So those are just a few uh, tips that I would give uh, to get into the Word of God. Remember, the Word of God is food for the soul. If you went without eating physically, you would die eventually. If you don't eat the word of God, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that is written uh, that comes from the mouth of God. And so we need soul food to feed us as well. Absolutely. I think this is a, one of the best advices that the tips you have given, the resources you have given, that Bible is a word of God and we need to eat it daily. So thank Amen. you, Dr. Andy, once again for sparing time and talking to us. It was really a blessed time to have you here. 
Excellent. Enjoyed it. God bless you and your ministry.